So I get a DM and it says, hey, Justin, I'm about to go stage at insert high caliber place. I won't reveal it. What advice do you have for me? Or is there anything that I should keep in mind? And that's not just a one-off. I get messages like this all the time from you folks. I'm going to stage somewhere. I'm going to interview somewhere. I'm going to trail at this restaurant. And I think it typically happens. The reason that it's so in the moment or it's like, I'm going tomorrow is because it's when you get like the Sunday scaries, you start to get nervous about the environment that you're walking into. You're starting to second guess your skill set. A little bit of imposter syndrome is starting to set in. And so believe it or not, I actually have a piece that I wrote all about this. I put it in the newsletter. Most of you folks really liked the don't make it in house episode that I put out a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to do it again with this one because I've sent this to a ton of you over the past couple of weeks. And so this is titled pre stage advice. And I break down a couple of different archetypes of different stages so that you can hopefully quickly identify when you go into a location, like what am I being asked to do right now? Because ultimately, as I've shared in multiple pieces of content before, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. And so the more you can ace this part and then have a little bit of that mental horsepower available to be able to judge if the restaurant is right for you, try to forecast what your experience there is going to be like, the better your job experience there is going to be, which is going to lead to better skill development, better networking possibilities. Because at the end of the day, my hope is that you're able to land a job that you're stoked about, that you can commit to, that you get a bunch of knowledge from, and ultimately be able to leverage it for your next thing. Before we get into it, if you want to subscribe to the newsletter to get more musings like this, it's in the description of this podcast, or you can always check out joinrepertoire.com slash newsletter if someone shared this with you. Speaking of sharing, if you enjoyed this free episode, if you want to go ahead and give this a rating either on your Spotify app, if you listen there, or on Apple Podcasts, if you listen there, those are two really great ways to help support the show. That's absolutely free. I don't need anything else from you other than a quick star review from you. And if you want to share an episode like this with a coworker, someone in your life who would get value from something like this, that would just help increase our listenership, which then helps support the show as well. All right, let's get into the meat of this. What I'm going to do is kind of treat this almost like how audio authors treat audiobooks, where they'll almost read the piece, but then they'll add a couple of quips throughout. And so I hope this ends up being kind of a dynamic reading of this article that I wrote. So let's unpack the question. Remember, the question is, I'm about to go stage at a high caliber place. What advice do you have? Or is there anything that I should keep in mind for this experience? And so the first place I'd like to start is to remind you folks that your first day in a fine dining or Michelin starred kitchen isn't going to be a completely alien environment. When I say completely alien I mean like blue goo coming out of the walls gravity is slightly shifted like for the most part the building you're going to walk into is going to have four walls it's going to have a kitchen it's going to have industrial appliances they're working with food everyone's hopefully wearing pants that was a funny joke that I made in this article basically the punchline is 98% of the environment is exactly the same as your current kitchen or your culinary school that you're used to walking into every single day but you're still nervous to go into this kitchen and so that's what I'm trying to get you to identify is like what is that 2% for you? And so common questions that come up with folks is, what if I'm not fast enough, right? What if my speed can't keep up with the speed that these folks are executing at? What if they ask me about something that I don't know about? And some examples like this is like hydrocolloids that they might use to gel things, rare or exotic ingredients. Like I've never, they asked me to go into the walk-in and find finger limes. I don't know what finger limes look like, right? Or cooking techniques. Like, hey, I need you to go vacuum seal a bunch of these and then sous vide them in the combi oven at whatever. I don't know how to use a combi oven. Or, or maybe here's the ultimate one. The one that gets people really nervous is what if I get asked to cook a dish for them? That's like an ultimate kind of like nervous moment, right? And what I shared in the article that I just want to caveat this with is we have to rule out the answer that I would give to more experienced folks here from an advice perspective. Because if you're interviewing for a sous chef position or a chef de cuisine position, not a lot of this is going to apply in the same way. And you might get asked about these more technical elements. You might get asked to cook a dish. You might get asked about operations. You might get asked about leadership. And what's important with that is that's kind of like a separate podcast episode. And so if you folks want a rant on that too, there's a lot of stuff that I had to learn the hard way there. And if that would be valuable, please just share this on your Instagram story or send me a Twitter DM or something like that, where you would want me to elaborate on that further. But I like to give that caveat because a lot of people might listen to this and be like, well, I listened to you, Justin, and like this didn't apply to my sous chef interview. So that's kind of what I want to just put a pin in. So in my experience, most stages, or you can call it a working interview, fall into one of two camps. So camp number one is I'm calling the pair up, P-A-I-R, up, 
And the second camp is the processor. So they're both P words, the pair up and the processor. So let's start with the pair up. When you find yourself in a pair up situation, you will typically get matched with a chef de partie or a line cook, chef de partie meaning like the chef of the station, who is running that specific area of the kitchen or who is responsible for a set of projects. This is typically someone who has a pretty extensive list or has a lot going on. They have a busy day ahead of them. Because think about it, if you were to get paired up with someone who has an easy to manage section, that's just poor resource allocation from the management team. And there's no point in giving them a stagiaire like you because they don't need the extra help. Like they already have an easy day or they're already crushing their station. They don't need assistance. And so you'll typically get paired up with someone who is busy, basically. So once all of the formalities get out of the way, you get your tour of the kitchen. They show you exactly where everything is. You say hi to everybody. You get changed. Then they say, hey, you're going to be working with Sally today. And Sally is going to be delegating prep tasks from their list to you. This is real prep that's going to end up on their station for service. This is not uh, movie set food, right? So every single task that you can save them time on is one less thing that they have to do. So kind of think about it from your from from that perspective in your head when you get delegated things. Don't think about it like, okay, Justin, it's time to show them what you got. It's time to go as fast as possible. It's time to have peelings and like steam coming off of my knife as I'm going quickly. No, you're doing this person a favor. And the way I like to frame this for folks is if you weren't there today, if you were not on this working stage, they would probably have to do this job themselves. Or maybe there's something from the AM prep team that you're helping to assist with because they know that they have a stage coming in that day. And so your goal, and I'm going to say this a couple times, is to knock it out of the park for them. Give them mise en place that they are jazzed, stoked, beyond excited to work with. This means a couple things. And these are tips that I cover in uh, the course. This is stuff that we talk about extensively in Total Station Nomination. So this means asking for a demo of the project that they've asked you to do. And once you get that demo, you need to save that demo. If you're 65 rolled cucumbers in, check number 66 that you just did with the demo. So this might mean taking a little deli container, taking the rolled cucumber that they gave you and putting that inside of a deli container, not counting it as cucumber number one right? And so what you need to do is take that reference point that you just did, that's probably 45 minutes into the project, and check it with that demo. Is it exactly the same? And the tip that I like to add for folks here is after being, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes into the project, show your project to your pair up person. Don't go to the sous chef. Don't go to the chef de cuisine and be like, hey, look at this cucumber that I did. Go to the person who is the chef de partie who delegated that job to you and say something to the effect of, I wanted to confirm this is the standard we're going for. You can use that language if you want. You can twist this into be a, you know, something that's more natural for you to say personally. But what you don't want to do is come off in like a show offy, look at how good I am way. You basically want to let them know that you have their best interests at heart and you are working diligently to make sure that this task gets done to the standard that they have outlined for you. Now, let's talk about common traps with the pair up. So where things go wrong. And the first trap is attempting to go too fast or sacrificing accuracy. See this a lot. It is not realistic to think that you will be able to do 100% standard quality of what your pair up person can do. It is literally your first day. Like, I want to remind you of that. You might only be able to do 60% of their 100%. But if you're able to take a 50-minute project, 5-0-minute project off of their plate, that is still 50 minutes of time savings for them. You have to think about it like that. Not the 90 minutes that it took you to do the project. I hope that this math is making sense. So they give you the cucumber rolling project. It takes you 90 minutes to do. That is way slower than they could have done it in 50 minutes. But mathematically, you still saved them 50 minutes, right? So that's how you have to think about it. However... This only works and they only truly get 50 minutes of time savings if they can get an accurate result from you. If they cannot, it's not worth having you doing it, right? Them having to go back and do it again completely destroys the purpose of the pair up. And remember, because this person is probably already busy from the jump, you're digging them further into a hole. And so don't do that. <laughs> As I know that's like very blunt advice, but you know, that's trap number one. Trap number two is not understanding the use of the final product. And I see this a lot as well. So sometimes you're given incomplete instructions. Again, remember this person is busy. That's why you got asked to help them. You get told to, let's say, medium dice some celery root. 
They say, hey, here is 15 pounds of celery root. I need you to medium dice this. And you might spend 35 minutes like meticulously squaring off the vegetable. You want perfect medium dice on this only to find out that this is the celery root is going to be sweated out or maybe it's going to be roasted and then it's going to be used in a soup and it's going to get pureed, right? That is like total face palm emoji. And the reverse applies too. You think you're just shaving turnips that are going to get tossed in a salad and you're just like you take your peeler or your mandolin and you just go super, super fast, not worrying about how thick they're going to be. However, maybe because, again, you don't understand the use of the final product, these shaved turnip strips are going to be twirled for a garnish on the duck main course, and the thickness on these really, really matters. And so you go too thick on them, they won't hold the twirl. If you go too thin, they won't give the textural impact that the dish needs. And so ask about the final use so that you have clarity. And this language might be something like, hey, can I just ask what dish this is going to be a part of? Or how do you guys end up plating this once this is done? And then what that can do is that can give you just a quick answer of like, oh, this is going to be part of a puree, or oh, this is going to get turned into a sorbet, or oh, this is going to be like a vegetable garnish, like I am prepping the thing that the guest is going to visually see when they get this dish put in front of them. And so that's also really important. Okay, the last trap of the pair up is misreading the relationship. And so this might look like if you're on, let's say like a five day or a two week stage, the time will come for you and this person who you're paired up with to be the Mario and the Luigi of that station. On the first day, you are Robin and they are Batman, right? You succeed when they succeed. And so that's how you need to think of the dynamic, not like on day one, we are all of a sudden station partners. And so what this means is becoming fully invested and focused on positive outcomes for every single task that they have and not trying to rush in and defeat the bad guys by yourself. Share with me on Instagram a better duo relationship that might work better than Batman and Robin because I'm not quite convinced this analogy is the one that I want to go with. However, I hope what I'm trying to say is making sense on the dynamic that happens in something like the pair up. Okay, let's switch gears. Let's talk about the other commonality, and that is to find yourself in the processor role. When you have a stage that is a processor type stage, this can sometimes be done solo, and it can sometimes be done as a group of processor people. Here are a couple of common things that you might hear when you get a processor type stage. Take this Cambro of blanched fava beans and remove the secondary pots. Another one might be peel these 40 pounds of shrimp and save the shells for stock. Right? You might get asked to strain 60 quarts of chicken stock, or you might get asked to strain these eight quarts of lamb sauce three times because they strain it through double strainers a couple different times. You might get asked to pass 15 liters of carrot soup through a chinoise. You might get asked to peel 10 heads of garlic, shuck three cases of corn before putting it in the produce fridge, write labels for these 30 cryovac bags. The list goes on. And these might be projects for specific stations. These are getting used in different areas of the kitchen, or they might be a larger prep test tasks that benefits the entire kitchen. I remember when I staged at WD-50, all the stages would get together in kind of like the last like 20 minutes before everybody left the kitchen as everybody was kind of like writing their order list and breaking down. And all of us stages would peel garlic and we would peel shallots. And so then we'd keep those inside of lidded containers so that when all of the chateau parties came in the next day, anybody who needed garlic and shallots as part of the recipes that they needed to do would have them already peeled. And so again, sometimes it's for a specific station, sometimes it's not. Or the way that I think about it might also be as a stagiaire or an extern at per se, I would go around and fill everybody's salt ninth pans as part of their stations. And so I would line them all up. I would fill them all. And so instead of each of the individual chef de parties having to go to dry storage to get salt for their stations every day, I would just take care of it right when I walked in. And so again, these common traps, they can, they can be intermingled, right? Like they can swap, but I like to keep the nature of the type in mind as I came up with these traps and things that I've personally experienced. Listen, as much as I know I say we're in the food business, in a lot of ways we're in the people business. And what that often requires is team management. Between trying to get the latest schedule out the door, keeping track of all the time off requests your team puts in, and finding out where your labor is tracking for the day, it can be all so overwhelming. Seven Shifts is that secret weapon type tool that's your operations best asset. Let Seven Shifts help you streamline your team's work schedule. If you want to see the difference in your team's productivity and satisfaction, Satisfaction. Seven Shifts is giving you listeners a three-month free trial of their The Works tier, 
which I'm actually super stoked on because it's unlimited employees on this trial. So it's not like other trials where you kind of just get a little bit of the stuff. You can do this with unlimited employees regardless of the size of your business. So you can really kick the tires on the product and test all the great features like payroll integration and advanced reporting. Visit joinrepertoire.com slash seven shifts. That's the number seven S-H-I-F-T-S. Or you can easily just click the link in the description of this podcast to try seven shifts now and see the difference for yourself. Thanks so much to seven shifts for sponsoring this episode. So first trap of the processor role is working clean. So duh, Justin, of course I need to work clean. I've heard this advice before, right? But it's worth defining and expanding on. So what do people get wrong about this working clean advice? This bears repeating. Different kitchens have different cleanliness standards. This is not helped by the fact that a lot of tasks that get delegated to processor people often are tedious and messy by nature. They will tell you to go to a separate countertop or a separate area of the kitchen to do the beet spheres because beet juice gets everywhere when you're doing the beet spheres. Or same thing with peeling garlic. Little peels get everywhere. They get stuck to your fingers. They end up on the ground. All of this ends up being quite tedious and messy. And so your goal as the processor is to avoid all of the common red flags in production. That regardless of the kitchen environment, anybody who is worth their salt as a chef would look at that situation and be like, that's probably not great. So the first one is food on the floor. Food on the floor is not great. That is something that like even the health department will flag you for. The second one is like a chaotic countertop. And so common signifiers of this is like splattered food, uncontained trim. If you're working off of a countertop instead of inside of containers or off of your cutting board, that's also a typical red flag. Another one is being an unclean worker like you yourself, like physically. So this is like food on your apron, food on your chef coat, food on your shoes, having an ungloved hand with something that is, you know, being served directly to the guest as like a ready to eat item or like not using tools when you could be using tools. Again, I'm getting a little bit more advanced here that some people might not agree with. But again, if you can keep these in the back of your mind, that will help you not only make sure that you are putting on a good exemplification of how you work, but it is also like you need to read the room on some of these things. If you look around and nobody's wearing gloves and everybody's just kind of like able to touch the food with their hands, that's totally fine. But make sure obviously you take all of the other things that you know about food sanitation into account there. Secondly, if you see that everybody's using offset spatulas and tweezers, make sure that you go to your bag, you get that out of your bag, and that's what you end up bringing to a project, right? Again, if you want to go deeper on this, we talk about principle-based station setup inside of Total Station Nomination, but if you're unsure how to set up for that task, you can use language that is, of course, unique to you, but a question like, what's the best setup to make sure that I don't get flour on the ground because I want to work clean? And if you roll your eyes thinking about asking questions like that to people that delegate that to you, sure, you might get a scoff from someone, but isn't that better than getting roasted by the sous chef for having corn husks all over the ground because you didn't know that you can shuck into a Lexan container and then empty that Lexan container into the compost bin when it's full? Like, I would just so much rather get that insight information from the person who has done this every day for the past three months rather than me. It's my first day and I've never been asked to make this twill batter inside of this kitchen before. And all of a sudden now I don't know how to set up my station in a way that they are used to seeing it done. So the second piece that is a pitfall of of the processor role is lack of engagement. And what I like to tell folks in this type of environment is that it's easy to melt into the background when you're asked to do four hours, five hours of any of the tasks that I outlined earlier in this episode. You might not even be close to the rest of the brigade, right? Like I remember on my, at my stage at French Laundry, I got asked to shuck fava beans for, it was probably like almost three hours during service. So it was like, nobody was in the back prep kitchens. It was just me. And everybody else was doing all of the plating, all of the cooking, all of the callbacks. I could hear everything from up front. And I was shucking fava beans in the back when no one could see me. Nobody was keeping track of my time. Nobody was kind of like seeing how I was doing it. I didn't even get to see the food that was getting executed, right? So it's so easy. I completely understand. The other story that I like to tell is like I did this stage at this place called Oceana in New York City, and I was brought to a secondary kitchen in the processor style role that wasn't on even the same floor as the rest of the team. I was like upstairs. And so I completely understand if you get put in that type of a stage environment. But don't let that get in the way of you asking thoughtful questions and showing that you're excited about the work that you're doing. So between projects, let's say you finish the fava beans, ask about what dish or station that this project is for. Remember, some of the advice from the above part applies here. If you're being asked to go down to dry storage, ask, 
hey, is there anything else that I can grab for you because I'm going down to dry storage? Or you ask other people on your way down. Another piece of advice here that can it needs nuance to get explained properly. And the way that I think that I've landed on it that I like saying is to aim to be visibly focused while you're working. And so if me as a third party observer, if I came around the corner with my camera and I pointed a camera at you and I captured you for 25 seconds and I showed that footage to other people, they'd be like, yeah, you look visibly focused. Like maybe you don't look like excited. Maybe you don't look like you're kind of like pushing and redlining on your energy level, but like you look visibly focused. Like you look like you're engaged in what you're doing. It's not about being robotic. It's not about just be a workhorse and just like grunt it out. But think about it. This is a forecasting of what you're going to be like when you get tasked with more responsibilities. So show that you're going to be a valuable member of the team and other folks can count on you to be engaged in your work. In other words, avoid the negative feedback loop that I've certainly fallen into and that this feedback loop might look like you get asked to do a tedious task, you get uninterested, the team sees that you're not engaged, and then they say, oh, well, we can't give so-and-so more a more complicated task and so they give you another tedious task to do which makes you get more uninterested and then they give you even more you know tedious things to do and round and round the cycle goes the last trap of the processor role is misunderstanding the processor role you are going to get frustrated in the processor role there's no way around it the guy over there is working with wagyu she's using a blowtorch on meringue he's doing the garnish for the signature dish and i'm stuck here writing cryovac labels with a sharpie and a scissors and a roll of tape i'm literally not even working with food right like that is a huge frustrating moment i've certainly been there but the tasks that you're doing are tasks that the kitchen needs They are kitchen tasks by definition. The things that you're doing need to get done one way or another. You are not doing prep that, again, is movie set stuff. You're not working with fake food. The stuff that you're doing is not just going to be thrown away at the end of the night. You are assisting the team. I'm here to remind you that. And the tasks that you're doing are, sure, a little bit tedious and maybe not super exciting, but that's why they were given to you. Because it only takes a little bit of training to show someone how to do the task that someone asked you to do. And it's not the end of the world if the thing that you do is not perfect. If there are a couple threads on the corn that you husked, or if the fava beans that you uh, uh, peeled happen to have a couple of little bit of extra pod stuff on it, or it's not quite perfect, that's okay. The other like little bonus thing of misunderstanding that I see people do all the time in this role is they watch someone get four projects done in the time that it takes you to do one project. And when I, again, I'm here to remind you of is that is normal. The worst thing that you could do is compare your role as the processor to someone else's and not do justice to what is asked of you. So can I promise that you won't be asked about high acyl gel and gum or that someone won't pull a first day prank on you and ask you to go find the bacon stretcher from downstairs? No, I cannot promise you that. The bacon stretcher joke aside, I think the best thing you can do in those situations is come up with a few canned responses that you feel comfortable responding with that don't compromise your integrity. So I'm going to give a couple of examples. And again, you can twist these to make it more your own. So if someone asks you about, hey, what's the gelling temperature of high acyl gel and gum? You might say something like, I'm not familiar with that. How do you use that here? And then you're honest you show that you're curious. And again, you're asking for the answer. You're not trying to flub your way through something, right? All right, let's do another one. You might get asked, what, how long does it take to soft boil an egg? And you might say something like, quote, I'll admit this is the first time I'm working with soft boiled eggs. Can you walk me through the basics on this? Awesome. You're being honest. Not everyone is a walking food encyclopedia. And of course, the person Working with this stuff on the day-to-day is going to be an expert on this topic. And so you're actually being genuinely curious in asking what the answer is. All right, let's do one more. So someone says, uh, hey, Justin, I need you to go downstairs and go get the Ultratex powder. So I might say something to the effect of, got it. Forgive me. I was given a lot of information early on in my tour of the kitchen. Can you remind me where I can find that? And what I like to tell people is, remember those early videos I made on the channel where I talked about having a notebook on your stages? You can have huge bonus brownie points if you pull out that notebook book as you're finishing up with this sentence and you say, can you remind me where I can find that? I'm going to write it down so I don't forget, right? Oh my goodness. Huge bonus points compared to the person who is also maybe staging with you and trying to go for the same position that you're going for, who is super unengaged, who is also forgetting everything and who doesn't write things down. So a lot of the pre-stage jitters can be eased by just understanding the pair up and the processor. 
concepts and just expecting that to be your experience. When you go into a restaurant like this, chances are you're either going to get paired up or you're going to get asked to do processing stuff. And as with almost all of the concepts that I cover here on the channel, it could be both. You could start off your stage while prep is happening as a pair up relationship. And then after staff meal, once service starts, you will get delegated into a processor role and you will get asked to pick spinach for two hours into service. And then you might get asked to come on Garmage station and pair up again. And the cycle will continue, right? Because at the end of the night, you're going to get asked to go into a processor role again and write labels for everybody. So it's like it ebbs and flows in these environments. But these tips that I outlined will hopefully help you make the most of these experiences, regardless of which one you get slotted into. And so, again, I've mentioned it multiple times. Last bonus tip, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. If you are seeing cleanliness standards that aren't being adhered to, if you're seeing the culture of the team not being quite what you would have hoped, that is okay. The current hiring landscape is starving for engaged talent right now. I see it all the time. Every single chef that I interview on the podcast tries to get me to mention hiring stuff. So make sure that if there is a previous podcast guest or someone inside of the Repertoire Pro community that you want to ask about, you do that and that we can get you into the new position that you probably are desiring and wanting to go for. And, you know, what I like to tell people is other organizations would be happy to have you if you're not seeing what you want to see inside of your organization. If there's anything that I missed or any other expansions that you want to see me go on, please, please, please let me know whether that's in an email, whether that's in an Instagram DM. And the best thing you can do if this brought you value or if you someone comes to mind who is like staging right now and this would bring them some value or they're a little bit nervous, please share this with them. And again, I hope that this is a quick primer that anybody can listen to like in the in the in their car in the parking lot or if they're just, you know, what two streets down from the restaurant and they're just kind of like I'm in your ears right now. I, I really hope this helps. I know you're going to crush it. And everything you can do to go beyond this episode is linked in the description. My name is Justin Connor with Repertoire and I hope you folks have a good one please roll the outro well well here we are together again at the end of another episode of the repertoire podcast if this is your first time listening this is a show for hospitality creators who want to think better increase their performance and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have already learned i am your host justin Kana, and if you're new here i'd like to personally welcome you to the show i hope you enjoyed this episode friendly heads up to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests links to specifics that got brought up in this episode as well as other helpful content that we create and share here online because everything we do is focused on helping you along your journey. If you don't have a ton of time, the best place to start is with some value sent straight to your inbox every single week. It's called the Repertoire Newsletter, where we share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. If you subscribe, we'll keep you up to date on trends that are shaping the hospitality creator ecosystem. We'll share discounts on gear that we find, as well as content that we've been producing ourselves and helpful articles that we've already read and decided are worth your time. Last up, if you want to connect with other industry professionals in the Repertoire Pro community, you want to check out courses like Total Station Domination or download free tools that we've created, you can learn more at joinrepertoire.com. That's J-O-I-N-R-E-P-E-R-T-O-I-R-E.com. The only ask from me is that if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate a review of this show on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. Regardless, I'll see you in the next episode. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.